Okay, let's get started then. So first of all, thank you for all, all, for, all, for coming over here. So it's the last session of the day. So uh, let's try to keep it interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit about Ceph. Since uh, you're all here, well, probably some of you have tried in the past to deploy Ceph in a, ideally in a highly, in a, as a highly performant cluster and with a bit of luck you might have succeeded. But most of you either have tried to deploy a highly performant Ceph cluster and have failed or are only thinking about deploying a Ceph cluster and you probably don't know that yet but you might have some problems with that. So during this talk, during this session, what I will try to do is I, try, I will try to go through some of the most typical pitfalls people run into when deploying their first or second Ceph cluster. Specifically, what we will do is we will focus on the concept of hardware for the OSD nodes. So what are OSD nodes, we will cover in a little bit. Um, but overall, we will focus on hardware, so networking, CPU, memory, and obviously storage uh, for the OSD nodes for Ceph. Um, my name is Piotr, I'm here with Bright Computing where I look after integrating our cluster management software uh, with various cloud platforms including OpenStack and my downtime I also help out with managing our own Ceph cluster. So, um, Ceph. So, as you probably have heard, nobody really wants to have a Ceph cluster. People want to have a storage solution which can be consumed by their, by their application. So, um, we are no different than that. So, typically, uh, what you would do when you combine Ceph with OpenStack, uh, you would want to deploy it at least for Glance, probably also for Cinder and Nova to provide a full storage solution for all of the OpenStack services. And depending on whether you want to go with 7 Rattles Gateway, you might go with that, or you might go with Swift for object storage. But either way, during this session, we will focus on the Ceph in the context of OpenStack. So when deploying a small scale OpenStack cloud, um, many people simply go either with the reference drivers for Nova, Cinder, and Glance. So that's typically either NFS or just local storage. Not that it's a good practice, but it's simply a simple thing to configure just to get started. Um, however, for larger scale uh, deployments and for any production deployments, you would typically want to have a distributed and redundant network-based storage. Um, with that, you typically have two options. Either you go um, with a proprietary storage appliance or several of those, just hook them up, plug them in, power them on, and consume the storage. Or you try to build such a distributed and, and re resilient storage yourself. So if you have a look at the uh, user survey um, conducted among our community, it's clear that when it comes to uh, providing storage for Cinder and also for other services, Ceph is by far the most heavily used uh, driver for providing that storage. Um, so why is it? I mean, is it because it's free? Is it because it's simple? Is it because it's flexible? Is it all of those things? So in order to try to answer this question, on the next slide, what we will do is we will have a look at the at a very brief uh, case study following a well a typical self admin throughout their day of work. So let's have a look at that. So just as a reference, the color orange will refer to self itself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let's have a look one more time. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I guess you could say that Sev is a tough nut to crack. But yeah, uh, it's not so simple, in other words. Um, so why is that? Well, Sev is, is complex. I'm not saying it's a bad solution. It's actually pretty good. And we've been using Sev for a few years now. We have two, maybe three, depending how we counted, Sev clusters. Um, um, ourselves and you're very happy with it but the fact is that it's not easy to configure it's not easy to deploy and uh, most of all it's not easy to select the best type of hardware for your SDs when you're just starting out starting out with your Ceph cluster so the typical problem you will face is um, you'll have to answer how many OSDs or how many OSD demons or in other words, how many disks per a single node you would want to have in a single Ceph OSD node, be it one, be it four, be it maybe more than that. So with that, you typically talk about the concept of thin OSD nodes, which have typically less than 10 uh, disks in them, or maybe fat OSD nodes, which have well typically more than 20 or so disk storage disks uh, inside them. So 
Uh, further on, we will try to compare those and see what's the, what's the sweet spot for those. So yeah, in other words, that's what we will cover today. How many as these um, as per nodes should you have? So I should probably um, point out that oh yeah, so that's actually our agenda. Uh, so maybe let's have a look at that first. So um, first, I'll give you, give you a little bit of background and um, just to give you an idea where we come from in terms of how we consume Ceph and why it's important for us to not spend too much time managing Ceph. We simply want to have a Ceph deployment work properly for us uh, so that we can consume the storage, but we don't want to have a dedicated team of people managing it throughout the day. We simply want it to run and behave reasonably fast. Um, so we'll go through a little bit of background for that. Uh, after that, we'll have a brief introduction to Ceph for those of you who might be new to the topic. And after that, we will jump to the main part of the session. So we'll dis uh, discuss all those individual pieces of, um, of hardware which you have to consider when creating your own Ceph cluster. Uh, after that, we will compare the FAT and the FIN OSD nodes, hopefully draw some conclusions, and at the end, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. So, a little bit of background. So, as I said, I'm here with uh, Bright Computing. We basically are a software product company. We have a single product which allows administrators to easily turn a pile of hardware into a fully functional cluster. Now, this cluster can be any type of cluster. It can be a HPC cluster, a OpenStack private cloud, a Ceph cluster, Kubernetes cluster, Hadoop Spark, whatever you want. Um, well, that's all we do, and we don't really want to spend time managing our Ceph deployment. Now, um, well, that's a typical cluster for those of you who might not be familiar with the concept. We have a head node in the middle, which stores the configuration of the entire deployment. And then we have slave nodes or compute nodes on the right-hand side. So in, this, in the case of this diagram, they might be running some OpenStack services on them. Um, but what's, what's important here is that, well, unlike some other vendors, we try to provide our customers with different, um, with more than one reference architecture. So ideally, we would want to uh, provide our customers with full flexibility with regards to how they want to structure their cluster. Maybe they want to combine Ceph and OpenStack and Kubernetes and Hadoop on the same cluster. We want to make it easy. So what that means in practice is that our developers, our basically entire engineering staff, has a lot of different scenarios to consider when developing new features, when testing them, and so on and so forth. So with that, we, uh, we are in need of creating a large amount of clusters internally only to be able to develop our product. And that's actually where uh, OpenStack and Ceph come in. So we have our own OpenStack private cloud, um, which is based on Ceph. Uh, we also have something which is called Cluster on Demand, which is a small set of scripts built on top of OpenStack, which effectively allow our engineers and also some of our customers to very easily deploy virtualized versions of our products, so virtualized clusters, within our OpenStack cloud. And what's cool about it is that um, it's possible to do in under two minutes. So developers don't really want to wait two hours to deploy the cluster only to test a feature or test, test a bug fix, right? So they want to be able to provision entire cluster very rapidly. Uh, but I won't, be diving, I won't be talking about cluster on demand over here, so if you want to know more about it, just approach me after the talk and we can discuss it. Uh, but basically, that's a bit of background in terms of why we don't want to care about Ceph all that much. Um, just a quick diagram how the cluster on demand is structured. So on the bottom part, what you see is the physical layer of the cloud. Um, that's our physical hardware. In the top right corner, you can see individual clusters provisioned by, by our uh, engineers. So we have a, one, one, of, one of the clusters over here is running HPC and Hadoop. One other is running some other resources. And then yet another is running a virtualized version of OpenStack. So all of those, like I said, are pretty easy to deploy thanks to Ceph and uh, copy and write. So yeah, that's our private cloud. We call it Krusty the Cloud. Um, it's not too big, only about 17 hypervisor nodes, give or take 10 uh, Ceph OSD nodes. We are planning to extend it shortly to about 10 OSDs. But it's been working out pretty well for us. So at any, any given time, we have about 400 VMs running there, which boils down to approximately four, four, 100 pretty small clusters, which is enough for um, development work. Mm, that's our management interface. Mm, incidentally, that's something which both uh, our cluster administrators see as well as 
the end users which provision clusters. So since we use the same piece of software to provision the physical layer and to manage the physical cluster as well as the virtualized cluster, clusters, that's, typic, uh, that's the typical that's the management interface which is available for managing and monitoring both of those layers. Uh, I won't be going into too much detail on this one, so I only posted this over here in case somebody's interested in having a look at the, how approximately our private cloud is uh, structured in terms of networking and different uh, control data planes. So the slides are online, there will be a link at the very end of the last slide, so if you do not have to take photos right now, you can just download the slides later on and have a look if you're interested in that. Um, okay, so in a nutshell, we create many VMs. Uh, we make heavy use of copy and write to um, create, uh, create pre-installed head nodes and customize them towards users' requirements. And yeah, the bottom line at the very end is that we don't really want to care about managing SEV itself. Um, okay, so before we start with a brief introduction to SEV, uh, let's just do a quick uh, show of hands. Uh, how, many, uh, how many of you guys over here and gals uh, are running their own SEV cluster? Okay, good. Uh, how many of you are not running your Ceph cluster but are, but are thinking about running one? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I guess I can skip that part since majority of you, it seems, are pretty familiar with Ceph. So obviously, software-defined storage solution, object block, file storage, yada, 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 popular with OpenST OpenStack, Rados. So probably most of you have seen this slide, so might as well skip it as well. Uh, rather as well, reliable, we have multiple replicas of the data, so every piece of data is stored on multiple nodes, ideally at least three of the nodes. It's self-healing, so well, if one of the nodes goes down, Seth will try to uh, restore that replica from the remaining replicas onto one of the other remaining nodes. Obviously it's distributed, so the failure domain it can be spread across hosts, across trucks, chassis, data centers, even entire regions. Scalable, so as you have probably most of you have heard, it's one of the biggest self deployments is over at CERN. Um, yeah, clients, one of the unique features of CEV is that clients can access the, the data directly rather than always have to go through a, uh, through a monitor node or through a, um, some kind of a point which will point them where the data is. So that's also, that also makes CEV quite efficient. And yeah, they mentioned copy and write. So in our case, we use copy and write to um, create head nodes from images uh, stored in Glance without having to actually copy all of th all those gigabytes of data and simply do a reference copy inside of Ceph. So it's been working pretty out well for us so far. So, so um, when it comes to types of Ceph nodes, as you know, well, we have Ceph OSD nodes, Ceph uh, monitor nodes, and if you're r running with Ceph FS, you also typically talk about Ceph, um, Ceph metadata uh, server nodes or metadata, me metadata nodes. Uh, during this talk, we'll be uh, focusing mostly, uh, purely, on the OSD nodes, uh, so the nodes which actually store, store Ceph data. So that's the same slide which we've seen earlier, uh, pretty much um, how many OSDs you want to have. So the way you typically deploy Ceph is you want to have a single OSD daemon managing a single spinning or SSD, a single disk storing the data. So in this case, you can see in the main part of the screen, you can see a close up to a single node having a, running a five OSD nodes, each uh, managing data which is being stored on a specific disk. Um, so fat nodes versus thin nodes. So let's have a look at that. Uh, so whether it's better to have uh, a bit more of a, of a less dense nodes or maybe fewer nodes which are really dense as in they have many USDs with many disks in them. So FAT nodes first. So typically we, when we talk about FAT nodes, uh, that depends, but you typically talk about nodes which have um, more than 20, 20 HDs, probably a few SSD journals to speed up um, data writes. Well, they are typically cheapest per petabyte because you save the, the money on not having to buy that many CPUs, motherboards, and so on. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, they are a bit more difficult to set up, a bit more difficult to maintain. Also because you have fewer nodes, uh, that means that one of them goes down, Ceph will have to take uh, more time to restore the data uh, to other nodes, basically to recover from the failed state. So that's also something which you would have to consider 
Also more, H, uh, more, more disks uh, often means uh, more CPU cores, which often means more CPU sockets, which means that you probably want to start thinking about NUMA and how that impacts um, the performance of your system. What is NUMA we will cover in, in, a, in, a, in a bit. Um, and yeah, overall, bottom line being that with dense nodes, there's more services running within the operating system. There's much more data going through uh, network, uh, through NICs, through disks, and simply there's much more uh, potential for bottlenecks in various places. So much, um, many more things which you have to worry about if you go with further nodes. Uh, well, thin nodes on the other hand, well, they are typically a bit more expensive because you have to, well, obviously purchase a bit more CPUs, but again, depends on what hardware you purchase. Uh, the self recovery is faster, so if one of the nodes goes down, that typically constitutes a smaller overall percentage of your cluster, and that also in turn means that it will take less time for self to recover to a consistent state. But on the other hand, you will need more space in your racks and also more power needed to actually fuel that cluster. Uh, but if you're just starting out with Ceph, well, from our experience, at least going with thin nodes is a good place to start to experiment with Ceph. Okay, so what's the speed, sweet spot over here? So we'll try to explore that in the next uh, few slides and hopefully there are some conclusions over here at the end of the session. Okay, um, so that would, cover, that would cover the introduction to Ceph. So uh, the next few slides will go through networking and then disks, CPUs, and memory uh, recommended for your Ceph OSD nodes. So let's start with networking. Again, we're talking about Ceph in the context of using Ceph for OpenStack. Um, and with that, uh, one of the first, well, you will typically need three, uh, three networks to actually um, power such a solution. So the first network you will need is a, some kind of a networking fabric to, um, for the communication, for the traffic between your VMs, essentially, right? Uh, so VMs have to talk to each other one way or the other, be it via a flat network or via overlay networking or VLANs. You have to have some kind of fabric to uh, carry the traffic. Another fabric which you will need is uh, fabric for OpenStack and for the VMs and uh, services like Glass API to actually access Ceph. Um, and manage it. So that's another network you need. And then yet another, ideally, um, a, a network over which, which is used by Ceph to replicate the data. So as I've mentioned as well, if one of the no Ceph OSD nodes goes down, Ceph will autonomously try to replicate the data to other nodes from the remaining copies, and that data has to go through a network. So how to approach that? Well, there are several solutions. Well, the simplest one would be to go with a single networking fabric. So what I mean by that, you can think of a single switch and maybe some VLANs on top of that, which would fuel all of those three networks mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, that's by far the simplest solution, but it has some problems. So first of all, you have a, if you're talking about Ethernet, you have a single, uh, single broadcast domain, which under high load might increase the overall, overall latencies within the network. Over also bandwidth limitations, so there's only as much data as you can push through a single fabric. So for example, if your Ceph um, is replicating data in the backend, um, that might impact the performance, the bandwidth available for the traffic used um, for the traffic between the VMs available for communication between the VMs, and vice versa, of course. So that's something to consider. Um, a different solution would be to have a dedicated, dedicated networking fabric, so think of it as dedicated networking switch, or, uh, for each, um, a dedicated NIC, of course, on each of the nodes, for each of those three networks. So you'd have a, a dedicated um, network for, uh, for traffic between the VMs, dedicated network for accessing Ceph, and then dedicated network for um, uh, Ceph replication. So with that, ideally, what you would also want to have is you would want to have all of those networks to be at least uh, well equivalent of 10 gigabits per second. I mean, you could go with one gigi, but by modern standards, it's actually pretty slow. Uh, but then again, well, 10 gigi cards are expensive, and with three uh, three NICs, it might be uh, or three uh, 10 gigi ports. Uh, well, that also might be a bit tricky to. Um, well, to come up with such a hardware. However, uh, if you do not go for a converged solution, so if you decide to spread your hypervisors on a separate set of nodes and then you have your SEV OSDs uh, 
or server is ddmons on a separate set of nodes, uh, then basically pretty much all you need is a single dual, dual port 10 gig NIC for each of those nodes. So you'd go with uh, one 10 gig NIC for your hypervisor nodes, with one of, the, of those ports used for carrying, say, the overlay traffic, so either v v VXLANs or VLANs, and the other NIC used by the hypervisor nodes to access uh, Ceph itself, so that's the so-called Ceph public network. Um, and then for Ceph OSDs, uh, again, a single dual, dual port 10 gig NIC, NIC, one for uh, data being pushed to Ceph, and then the other, uh, the other NIC used for the replication network. Also, probably most of you know that, know that, but obviously when you write data to Ceph, uh, it is being replicated as it's being written. So data comes in, in this scenario, data would come in through the Ceph public network, and before the write would return to the client, uh, Ceph would use the Ceph cluster network to replicate the data to additional, uh, to additional Ceph OSD nodes, which have to store the replicas for that particular object. So yeah, so that would be uh, my recommendation if you have the flexibility to design your own networking solution uh, underpinning your Ceph and OpenStack clusters. Um, yeah, many people will tell you go with nine, uh, 9K MTU rather than 1500. Um, we did some benchmarks on that actually. We haven't seen all that much difference, but that probably points out that we are underutilizing Ceph somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, the overall consensus that uh, 9K MTU is definitely better. And like I said, uh, 10 gig as a minimum uh, for those fabrics. So um, we've covered uh, networking. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what disks uh, to choose for your OSDs. So with a 10 gig fabric, you typically want to go with SSDs uh, for storing journals um, for your Ceph, uh, for your Ceph OSD nodes. Uh, so basically what uh, SSD-based journals do is they uh, coalesce the writes, a large amount of small writes into a fewer amount of bigger writes, which then later on get pushed to your HDDs. So effectively, uh, I.O. is a bit faster when clients are write, writing data to Ceph. Um, one thing to keep in mind when picking your, when selecting a SSD for your journal, you do want it to be robust. So you probably don't want to go with a consumer grade SSD because all well, those only have a very finite amount of data they can write, um, they can accept uh, throughout their life cycle before actually burning out and dying. So you probably want to go with a bit uh, more, uh, more solid, more robust uh, SSD node over here. Um, when it comes to uh, how much, uh, they, how fast your SSD should be, well, those are the two last bullet points on this on this slide. So, if you happen to go with a one gig networking, well, that effectively means that your clients can only push as much as, well, almost 128. 128 megabytes per second to your Ceph OSD nodes, whereas uh, regular uh, SATA SSDs are capable of easily accepting up to 400 megabytes per second. So that's one, uh, another reason why you wouldn't want to go with one gig networking, but instead should consider a 10 gig uh, networking. So with a 10 gig network, you can probably fit in as much as three SSDs, three regular SSDs um, behind a single 10 gig NIC, and um, or a, a single PCI Express, maybe NVMe based uh, SSD, which uh, those are capable of much higher write uh, write speeds, up to well, 2,000 megabytes per second. So if you go with those, you might even consider a bit uh, thicker pipe than only 10 gig. Um, okay, so that's an example that's pretty close to what we use for our own um, OpenStack uh, and Ceph deployment. So in our case, we use Intel DC series R S3700 SSDs, pretty small ones, 200 gigabytes. That's enough for an SSD journal. Um, we did some research, uh, a colleague of mine did quite a bit of research actually uh, into how, which SSD is the best and well that, that's basically the consensus from all the various sources he found. Many people recommend that, many people use those and many people are very happy with those and so are we in fact. Um, yeah, so uh, let's do a little bit of math over here. So assuming that you have a single um, journal SSD of this class, which is capable of approximately 375 megabytes per second. Uh, how many 
HDDs can you put behind it? So as you can see from, um, from the bullet over here, um, it's pretty much equivalent to about five, um, five data st regular data storing uh, spinning drives which can, be, which can sit behind a single SSD, um, which is actually in line with the rule of thumb guideline, which you might have heard uh, already, that typically you want to have somewhere in between four to six uh, HDs behind a single SSD. But keep in mind that if your SSDs are really fast, like they are, say, uh, say you're using PCIe e and VME drives, uh, which are capable of much faster sequential write speeds, then you would be able to put many more uh, individual HDDs behind them. So um, in our case, and assuming a 10 gig networking, we can have as much as uh, 15 HDDs uh, in, our, in our SSDs. So with a 10 gig networking, we can have easily three SSDs with five uh, HDDs beh uh, behind each one of those. And in total, that's the pretty much the theoretical maximum of uh, the amount of OSDs which uh, we can have in our nodes. Okay, so those are the disks. Let's have a look at uh, how many CPU cores uh, we should aim at over here. Uh, but first, how many sockets should we need? So, as I mentioned earlier, if you go with uh, multi-socket architectures for your motherboards, you will probably have to start thinking about um, something called NUMA, which stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access Architecture. And Basically, what, um, what it boils down to is, I won't be going into too much detail, so by the way, there's an there's a excellent talk about NUMA over here, so if you want to know more about it, be sure to check it out. Um, it's from the uh, previous OpenStack Summit, I think by guys from Comcast, if I recall correctly. Um, basically, what it boils down to is, if you have two, uh, two CPU sockets, uh, some of the, one of the sockets, um, uh, one of the sockets uh, processes interrupts from some of the devices in the, in the, in the box and the other socket processes interrupts from the other socket, uh, from, from the other devices. So one example is uh, what we have over here in the, in the third bullet. So say one of your CPU sockets uh, processes the data coming in from your NIC, whereas the other CPU socket processes the data which goes to and from your SSD. So what happens here is as the data comes in, it, have to, it has to go in to one of those CPUs. It has to call, cross the so-called QPI bus between the sockets before it can end up on the SSD. And so it might not seem like a big deal, um, but well, at least according to the guys which uh, the, the, the talk I quoted over here, is actually a pretty good deal uh, when you actually start measuring that under high load for very thick nodes. Basically what it means is there's actually quite a bit of traffic going uh, back and forth over the QPI bus and it might uh, very negatively impact your overall self performance. So with that, if you don't want to have to think about that, then you don't have to think about things like pinning your server SD processes to specific, uh, specific CPU cores or CPU, uh, CPU sockets, then a safe bet would be to go with a server SD node which only has a single socket. And so you don't have to worry about um, all of those things. Again, a more pragmatic approach. Um, how many cores? Well, um, a rule of thumb is to have a one CPU or half, half a CPU core per a single OSD um, daemon, so half, an, uh, half a CPU core under normal operation, maybe one CPU core when it starts uh, under failure, when it starts data recovery, data replication, and then the CPU load goes a bit up. So with like 12, uh, with 12 OSDs, you would probably need around 12 CPU cores. Uh, ideally, you'd want to pin your servo SD processes to specific servo SD cores so that they don't jump back and forth between them. Uh, Hyperthreading enabled, disabled, so again, the overall consensus seems to be that uh, when you talk about cores for these self OSD processes, you want to think about uh, hyperthreaded cores. So you definitely want to have hyperthreading enabled. Although I must say that I haven't done any actual benchmarks on that, so over here I, um, I'm just conveying what I've heard uh, from other members of the community. Uh, how much memory? Again, so our rule of thumb would be about one gigabyte of RAM per one terabyte um, of, your, of storage stored on your servo SD nodes. Obviously more is better uh, since with more data you have more, uh, Linux has more capability of uh, utilizing its virtual file system 
a caching mechanism to speed up writes to, uh, to speed up reads to obtain some of the, some of this data uh, when it's being read by the clients. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so here are some examples. Okay, so let's quickly summarize what we've discussed uh, so far. So, um, what, to, what to consider when designing the hardware for your, or pick, selecting the hardware for your Ceph uh, OSD. So, first of all, it's networking fabric because, well, it um, pretty much determines the amount of uh, the number of SSDs and the overall performance of the cluster which you will have and the amount of SSDs per a single node. Once you know the amount of SSDs per node, uh, that will pretty much, and once you know the type of SSDs you will want to have per node, this will also tell you how many uh, regular spinning drives you would want to have per a single node. So like in the example earlier which we've covered, we said that with a typical um, decent class SSD, that would be about five uh, disks per a single SSD. And then the number of disks itself, once you know that, it will basically tell you how many CPU cores you would want to have. So typically one CPU core per, uh, per disk. And uh, yeah, uh, the amount and the overall size of the disks will in turn tell you how much memory you will need uh, for your server SD nodes. Um, yeah, so we're pretty much um, almost done. So that's just a quick comparison of different types of nodes and different theoretical performance characteristics which one could expect of those. So from left to right, we go from an unreasonably thin node all the way to a very well, extremely fat or morbidly a fat node, you could say. Um, so in the unreasonably thin node, what we have is we have the unreasonably thin cluster. It consists of very thin nodes which basically have a single SSD and a single HDD in them. So a very unreasonable solution in practice, but just for comparison. So we have 96 of those nodes, um, 96 HDDs total, and actually you can see that all of those individual clusters, that's the first row, all of them have 96 HDDs only spread out across different number of nodes. So with the, uh, like I said, with the uh, very thin nodes, so what we have is uh, one HD per node and one SSD per node. Not something you would you would want to run in production. Obviously, with only one H HDD, you're heavily underutilizing your SSD. Um, but yeah, mm, you, like I said, you, don't, you wouldn't want to run that in production. Then you have a the the thin node. So over here we have um, approximately 16 individual individual nodes each node with six HDDs and a single SSD. So that's a more reasonable uh, scenario. Mm, but again, over here, if you're talking about a 10 gig networking, we're actually underutilizing the network because um, yeah, a single, a single regular SSD will only be capable of accepting that much uh, uh, traffic. Um, then we have a more pragmatic approach. So over here, we're talking about eight nodes with 12 or 10 um, HDDs each, approximately two SSDs per node. So that's a bit better utilization um, of, uh, of, of the network overall. But yeah, with that many HDDs, you will probably need to go, depending on your hardware vendor, you will probably need to go with a bit, uh, a bit higher chassis. So if you're talking about the three and a half inch drives, you will probably want to go with a 2U chassis for the nodes. Then you have a, well, a regular node. So over here, we're talking about six Ceph OSD nodes um, with 16 HDDs each. Uh, with three SSDs in front of those 16 HDDs. And over here, you can see that with three SSDs, we are actually very close to um, perfectly utilizing our, our networking infrastructure, assuming that we are based on 10, 10 gigi. So with three SSDs, you can actually reach a theoretical sequential max speed of about uh, well, almost 10 uh, gigabits per second. So that's actually a pretty good solution for this particular networking uh, fabric. Um, but again, uh, over here you would have to go either with 2U or 3U chassis. Um, and then the last uh, scenario. So over here we have uh, with the same amount of HDD, so with the, also with 96 HDDs total, we are talking about only two nodes, but very thick ones, quite obviously, each one having 48 
um, HD so effectively 48 SSDs and with that many OSDs that also means that you will probably have to uh, go into the NUMA territory so probably not something where not not the place where you want to go if you're not familiar with that and well those last two columns well the main obvious drawback is that if one of the nodes goes down um, well you have problems with recovery so with, uh, in the case of the fat nodes where you have only two nodes in your entire cluster you don't will, have, will not have any recovery quite obviously um, with the cluster with only six nodes so obviously it should recover uh, but the, because of the fact that you're storing such a huge proportion of your data on each node if one of your nodes goes down then you're talking about really long recovery times overall yeah, so that's pretty much it. So just to summarize uh, some key takeaways. So we'll probably want to go with a 2U chassis with, um, when designing your self cluster, with a 2U chassis for your several SDs with 10, maybe 12, uh, three and a half inch HDDs and, a, and two SSDs. Or uh, alternatively, if you can afford a bit thicker, thicker chassis, higher chassis, then you could go with say 16 HDDs and uh, three SSDs or one PCI Express NVMe instead of those three SSDs. That should also be sufficient. Uh, you should probably prefer slimmer nodes if you can afford the additional cost and the additional space um, in your rack. That simply, that simply makes it a bit, uh, a bit simpler to manage to get started with. Um, if you can handle it, if you are experienced with Ceph, then you might want to go with uh, more thicker nodes. They are definitely more um, better for optimizing for overall cost of your storage at the expense of complexity. Uh, you probably want to avoid uh, multi-socket uh, motherboards for your servo SDs. Um, start out ideally with at least 10 giggy networking. Unless say small PLC, you probably don't want to go with one, one giggy. Um, avoid small clusters, obviously, like I mentioned uh, two slides earlier. Uh, with only like six SD nodes, if one of them goes down, that means pretty long recovery. Um, yeah. Also, some other random tips uh, just to keep in mind: uh, be mindful and read about deep scrubbing because it will kick in by default every week, and every week you will be wondering why the performance of your cluster starts going down. It's deep scrubbing, obviously. Um, read up on um, object and data striping um, that also has a performance uh, potential to increase the performance of your cluster. But that's not something I'm going to uh, get into over here. Um, one other thing is if you're, if you're using Ceph for, uh, Ceph for your uh, Cinder, uh, Cinder nodes, you definitely want to enable QoS. So before we've enabled QoS on our cluster, um, every now and then you'd have a runaway VM which would simply generate a lot of log output to the disk which would effectively saturate our entire Ceph cluster. So by throttling that, uh, the amount of sequential writes each VM can generate and the amount of IOPS it can generate, uh, we basically got rid of that problem. So again, definitely something you might want to check out. Same applies for Nova, obviously, if you're using Nova for your, um, for your VMs. Um, yeah, enable RBD cache on the client side uh, in libvirt so that it can aggregate s uh, small I.O. before sending it out uh, to your Ceph cluster. So it's called a feature called RBD cache. Um, there's tons of very interesting Ceph uh, videos out there on YouTube. So if you're just starting out with Ceph, again, be sure to go through them. And one other here, which I highly recommend, is one from one of the previous summits um, from the guys from CERN. Save at CERN, uh, that's the last bullet point. So yeah, definitely check this one out. And that's pretty much it. So thank you, any questions? A quick comment yep. uh, from the talk before about uh, QEMO optimizations. They uh -huh. had some test hardware from Intel, so probably the fastest PCIe SSDs available. Okay. Um, and they decided to run four OSDs per PCI uh, device because other than that, they would not be able to saturate the, the, the queue. So uh, okay. we're, we're already going in a direction that even the, the rule of thumb that everybody knows, one mm -hmm. OSD per device is with SSDs gonna be thrown out, of, uh, thrown out again. All right, that's good to know, thanks. Um, hey. Do you have any experience running uh, OSDs on SSDs? And in that case, do you have any recommendations on where to put the journal? Can you keep it on there or 
does it make sense to put it on the we Maybe don't have any experience with that. Uh, if I were to guess, but again, that's just a guess, you would probably want to keep it, unless you can afford the additional cost of a, maybe even faster SSD, right? Mm -hmm. So you could, for example, have two classes of SSDs, one very fast, ultra high, low latency only for the journal, and then simply several slower SSDs for regular data. So that would be one of the solutions. Right. Hi. Uh, one of the things that brought my attention on your presentation was the relationship between the bandwidth, the network bandwidth, and the, uh, the not only the type of the SSDs, but also the number. Uh, for every paper that you read, they always recommend that you should not stay with 10 gigs. But as you said, the, the, the regular size of the nodes, you only, you're going to have up to three SSDs. And these guys, SATA SSDs, these guys cannot uh, 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 talk faster than 10 gigs, which brings me the, the impression that you say that don't waste money on going beyond 10, 10 gigs on the Ceph uh, 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 network. Is, is that? Or? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. So definitely the faster your networking is, the higher the overall throughput of your Ceph cluster. So if you can afford 40 gig or more than that, then yeah, by all means, go for it. But the SSDs will cap your, your throughput or, or, or no? Because that's my understanding. I'm not saying that will definitely happen. Might depend on type of SSDs. Uh, right. But that's, uh, that's the feeling I get from experimenting with Ceph. And also, I mean, you cannot simply consider putting in faster SSDs, right? So indeed, we, you, can, uh, you will probably be able to reach 10 gigi with three data center class SSDs, but if you go with several PCI Express and VME drives, then yeah, why not? All right, thank you. Yep. Hard drives are getting bigger, of course, so uh, we're looking at possibly using eight terabytes and 10 and 12s coming out. By the end of the year, um, any recommendations on how big to your hard drives to use in your Ceph cluster? I didn't get the word, uh, what's that? Hard disk drives, you know, at the moment they're, um, I think you showed four terabyte drives in your example. Ah, yes, they're yes. Six, mm -hmm. eight, ten. Yeah, that's just an example, out. of course. So, yeah. So what are the risks of going to, obviously, the rebuild time of hard drive fails, but any other risks, or do you see going with bigger drives? Other risks? Uh, well, reliability, I would say, the bigger the drive, the smaller the size of the individual bit on it. So obviously, the higher the chance, that, uh, the higher chance of bit rot, for example. But that's something you have to consider on your own, right? Depending on what type of HDs you want to go with and how many of them you want to have. So. Well, you know, obviously, if you're looking at the dollar per terabyte price, you know, yeah, and you use eight terabyte drives, you can get a much cheaper, cheaper solution. Some of the reference architectures are coming out now, so uh, um, like the Dell solution is a, an R730 XD with uh, 16 8 terabyte drives and a couple of fast PCIe cards in front. So, <laughs> there yeah. you go. Trust. <laughs> yep. Uh, hi. Have hey. you considered uh, running uh, Ceph as this uh, right uh, with the Nova compute on this on the same hardware? Um, yes, we have, and in fact, we're doing it right now. Although we will be moving away from that, so um, well, it's a bit hard to gauge uh, how big of an impact a Ceph SD process can have on the performance of VMs. So, no, in our case, it's not a big deal because our VMs are actually, uh, most of the time, are fairly idle. So they do not generate that much load on our Ceph cluster. Uh, but one of the problems which you might face is, um, well, the complexity of the management. I mean, say you want to restart your hypervisor node, but you end up restarting hypervisor and a Ceph OSD nodes, which will generate, unless you bring that OSD out of your Ceph cluster, will generate quite a bit of traffic. So that complicates management a lot. Uh, but in other cases, if your VMs do generate a lot of CPU load, then you probably want to keep them uh, separate from your server SDs. But again, there's something to be said about both approaches. Okay, thanks. 
But there, uh, what's your experience comparing um, SaaS devices with uh, SSDs as journals and regular SATA, uh, sorry, SATA devices with SSDs on journals uh -huh. versus uh, regular SaaS devices? Well, I didn't do any comparisons on that, so yeah. Because our experience has been mm -hmm. uh, SaaS with uh, collocated journals usually compares almost the same in terms of performance, so if you do the maths, uh -huh. it's kind of one-on-one -on -one and you get better uh, cost okay. effectiveness with the SaaS. You for block storage? Yes. Uh, so uh, for RBD, not for uh, our Rados gateway. So I was interested in that if anybody in the room has been comparing the two scenarios. Okay, but wouldn't the latency still on SSDs uh, be much yeah. better, right? The, the latency is the only thing that's a bit better, but mm -hmm. if you go to a scenario where you're destaging to disk, latency goes True. the hell with SATA, so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's I just, one more question. I just wanted to make a comment to yeah? this gentleman over here about uh -huh. uh, NVMe-based journals. You, If you have the money, it does make sense to put the journals on NVMe because uh, your latencies for writes will go down. So, And also you can mix, uh, you know, endurance on your data-based SSDs. Uh, so. Yep, thanks. Okay, so um, one more thing. We have some T-shirts over here, so if somebody wants a T-shirt, yeah, just <laughs> come by. <laughs> yep, yeah. thanks.